Good morning. In today's headlines, early in-person voting for the midterms begin in Georgia and highlights from debates across the U.S. Sparks fly in Ohio as two candidates clash on the debate stage to determine who will be left after the November 8th elections for the U.S. Senate. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis visits a school on its first day back in session after the devastating hurricane, and he comes bearing gifts. The UK is issuing a formal warning toward Air Force pilots. The Chinese military is recruiting former British servicemen to train their military. And university personnel and students are now banned from self-printing and using AirDrop. This follows protests against China's leader. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. Good morning, and I'm Evelyn Lee. It's Tuesday today, October 18th. So, Evelyn, the Chinese regime steals intellectual property from the West and even recruits scientists and researchers with big incentives to rise to power. And now it's recruiting Air Force pilots for training purposes. I'm curious to see if the UK will pass a law banning their pilots from training the Chinese Air Force. Well, yeah, you got a point, but we'll, and we'll break that news soon. But first, and to your point, we will cover something that will surely affect the U.S. response to China. And that's the midterm elections that are just around the corner. And we are starting with some updates out of Georgia. Early in-person voting started there on Monday. Over 100,000 Georgians have cast their ballots already. And voters are also sending in ballots by mail. More than 1,000 were received by Friday. Over 200,000 people have requested mail ballots already. The deadline for requesting one is October 28th. Here's what voters at the polls had to say yesterday. I'd be crazy not to get out of my bed early in the morning to get up here and vote. Whoever we vote for is going to be up there <laughs> changing a lot of stuff, hopefully, and uh, putting Georgia on the map. We always talk about it being a fair and free election here in Georgia, so I'm hoping that that's exactly how it goes for everybody. You value where you live, you vote. If you value your children, you vote. That's your responsibility. That's part of being a citizens of this United States of America. More than 4 million people could vote in the state's election this year. Judging from past patterns, more than half are expected to vote before Election Day. Early in-person voting in Georgia ends on November 4th. And just hours after the polls opened in Georgia, candidates for governor squared off in the first of two debates. Incumbent Republican Governor Brian Kemp is in a rematch with Democratic nominee St Stacey a Abrams. Abrams narrowly lost to Kemp four years ago. Now Kemp is looking for a second term. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more on last night's debate. The gubernatorial candidates battled over issues like crime, voting, education, and abortion. Incumbent Brian Kemp clarified his stance on abortion and declared he would not take any further steps to restrict the procedure if re-elected. That's not my desire to do that. Georgians should know that my desire is to continue to help them fight through 40-year high inflation and high gas prices and other things that our Georgia families are facing right now, quite honestly because of bad policies in Washington, D.C., from President Biden and the Democrats that have complete control. Abortion is illegal in Georgia after six weeks of pregnancy. Exceptions are allowed for cases of rape, incest, or health risks to the mother. Challenger Stacey Abrams accused Kemp of being weak on gun laws, allowing dangerous people access to firearms, and flooding the streets with guns. Georgia does not have a waiting period. We do not have universal background checks. And one of the few permits that we had that was helping keep us safe stopped 5,000 people who should not have had weapons from getting them got weakened by this governor with his criminal carry law. Abrams criticized Kemp for signing a bill into law this year that allows gun owners to carry a concealed handgun without a permit. I know how to shoot. My great-grandmother taught me. But I know that the person who is most responsible is the person who holds the weapon. And that is why I will quote Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. Kemp defended his position and said he wants to be tougher on gangs and support law enforcement. You have local governments that are holding up concealed weapon permits that are keeping law-abiding citizens from being able to simply uh, uh, used their Second Amendment right to protect themselves and their property and their families. Although Abrams accused Kemp of voter suppression, Kemp touted record turnouts from Democrats and Republicans in Georgia's primaries. This is my time as Secretary of State. I'm the person that created the online voter registration system in this state where any Georgian can vote 
register to vote 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He also reminded voters he was among the Republican governors who relaxed public restrictions early in the COVID-19 pandemic. Libertarian Party candidate Shane Hazel also took part in the debate, but was often caught between the other two candidates and was asked very few questions. You keep going back to guns, Stacey, and I think it's going to be your undoing here in Georgia. Georgia, we're going to have less and less gun laws, whether it's under Republicans or Libertarians. Libertarians don't believe in any gun laws. We believe that you know how to best protect you and your property. Hazel lambasted Kemp for endorsing the government-distributed COVID vaccine. A second debate is planned for October 30th. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Another closely watched governor's race is taking place in Arizona. Republican nominee Carrie Lake has been labeled by some as a Trump extremist and election denier. Lake responded to this and addressed the importance of morality in last night's campaign event in Phoenix. And today's Melina Wisecup was there. We're here in Phoenix, Arizona, a state where the governor's race has garnered national attention. We heard from Republican gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake, who honed in on the moral and spiritual components of modern day politics. This includes everything from criminal justice reform to repairing broken family structures. Here's a look. I want to encourage fathers to, to be in the home. They're so important. And, and maybe it's just one person, one person's voice, and I guess I have a loud mouth talking about how important dads are. But we do need to make that a mission because when we don't have fathers in the home, it's, it's, it's bad for not just mom and kids, it's bad for the spirit of that man as well. The only time you can bring God, you can talk about God, is in prison. You can't talk about God in school. You know, it's separation of church and state. No, oh, no, 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 don't bring God in. Don't bring God into junior high and high school. When you can bring God in is in prison. We need to bring God before prison in people's lives. You want to elect people into office who have a moral compass, who know right from wrong. I think Ronald Reagan was a great example of that. We also heard from a few Democrat voters at the event to find out why they were voting against Lake. Here's what they had to say. The Republican Party that I see now is nothing like what I grew up in. Uh, my father be turning over in his grave, and he was he worked for Nixon in Nixon's White House. Okay, so I'm I'm all done with that. And when I see the re what the Republicans want to do is keep people from voting, because the more people that vote, the less votes, the less margin Republicans will have. And so that's what they're doing. And in Arizona, it's very extreme. And uh, you know, I'm going to vote against it. In the last election, it was actually ridiculous here what went on and all the recounts and and all of that and so that's a big motivation for me this year is all the election deniers as to the claims of being an election denier this is what lake had to say about that messaging let's talk about election deniers here's 150 examples of democrats denying election results oh wow look at this this is from this is from uh, Joe Biden's press secretary. Reminder, Brian Kemp stole the gubernatorial election from Georgians and Stacey Abrams. Democrats saying that. Is that an election denier? Right, Hillary Clinton, Trump is an illegitimate president. Is she an election denier? This one says, was the 2016 election legitimate? It now definitely is a question worth asking. That's the Los Angeles Times. So it's okay for Democrats to question elections, but it's not okay for Republicans. The event was called Ask Me Anything. People were able to submit questions which were read to Lake by host Jack Brewer. Brewer is a former NFL player turned political activist. It's the ninth event like this Lake has held. Lake said she views debates as a job interview and that she's doing it to let voters in on her policy stances since her Democrat opponent Katie Hobbs has refused to debate. Hobbs just says she refuses to debate because she thinks Lake isn't interested in having a substantive, in-depth conversation and that Lake will only try to control the dialogue. She has received criticism from fellow Democrats for a decision. And Democratic candidate for Senate Tim Ryan and Republican J.D. Vance on Monday debated Ohio's stance on guns, immigration, and abortion. This ahead of November's midterm elections. And today's Daniel Monahan has the story. J.D. Vance first rose to prominence after writing Hillbilly Elegy, a book about growing up in poverty in Ohio. Ryan won the Democratic nomination to run for the U.S. Senate seat vacated by retiring Republican Senator Rob Portman. 
On inflation and his voting for the Inflation Reduction Act, Ryan had this to say. It's been brutal, and I understand that. And that's why I've been calling for a tax cut in the short term uh, to put money in people's pockets. J.D. said that that was a gimmick. He then said that the Inflation Reduction Act drives down the deficit by $300 billion. Vance attacked Ryan's record in response. He says that I believe the tax cut is a gimmick. I think a tax cut's a great idea, but when you propose it, Tim, it is a gimmick. Because in your time in Congress, you voted to raise taxes $6.7 trillion, 113 times. Vance criticized the so-called budget savings of the Inflation Reduction Act, claiming that it actually raises taxes by $20 billion on working people in Ohio. On abortion, the candidates had this to say. If the Republicans control the House and the Senate, we won't be able to codify Roe v. Wade, which I think is the smart move. So I will spend all my time trying to fight a national abortion ban. Vance says a maximum time limit of when abortion access is permitted is reasonable. It's totally reasonable to say you cannot abort a baby, especially for elective reasons, after 15 weeks of gestation. No civilized country allows it. I don't want the United States to be an exception. The candidates also sparred on school shootings. I think allowing properly t trained teachers to carry firearms can be part of the solution. I think increasing funding for school resource officers can be part of the solution. He also says a very common sense approach to keeping society safe is making sure that violent criminals are locked up. Crime has become a hot button issue as overall violent crime increased nationally from January to June. According to Ryan, such a concept is too dangerous. That it is a very risky proposition to have a, a, a person that's a school teacher trained to shoot in that environment with all those kids running around. The candidates also traded blows on immigration. Vance charged Ryan and the Democratic administration with dubious motives to support immigration. The people he answers to in Washington, D.C., they're very explicit about that. They say that they want more and more immigration because if that happens, they'll ensure that Republicans are never able to win another national election. Ryan countered by calling Vance extremist and also claimed Vance runs around with other so-called extremists like Ted Cruz or Marjorie Taylor Greene. This great replacement theory was the motivator for the shooting in Buffalo, yes. where that shooter had all these great replacement theory writings that J.D. Vance agrees with. Current polls show the candidates neck and neck with Vance holding a razor-thin lead. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Voters are shifting to the right as the November elections near. Republicans have been emphasizing inflation, crime, and illegal immigration. Meanwhile, Democrats mostly focused on January 6th, women's rights, and the environment. Mark Penn, co-director of the Harvard Caps Harris poll, says Republicans are inching back towards a wave election after a summer when abortion seemed to turn the tides. A recent Time Siena poll shows Republican congressional nominees leading with 49 percent support to 45 percent for Democrats among likely voters. An October Harvard Caps Harris poll says 55 percent of Americans blame Biden for inflation, including 42 percent of Democrats and 84 percent of voters think the U.S. is in a recession now or will be by next year. 65 percent want increased American oil and gas production, according to the poll. Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis visited Toledo Blade Elementary School yesterday. It was the school's first day back in session after Hurricane Ian. DeSantis announced more than $200 million in awards through the school recognition program. So today we're able to announce uh, that we are awarding $200 million in school recognition awards for schools that showed student growth and teaching excellence in the 2021-2022 school year. Awards will go to 1,400 schools across the state. To be eligible, schools must receive a school grade of A or improve at least one letter grade from the prior year. Governor DeSantis says the awards can be used to give hardworking teachers bonuses. He adds that they are particularly important in southwest Florida, where they will go a long way toward helping teachers in that area get back on their feet. They can also be used for educational equipment or materials to assist in maintaining and improving student performance. The latest polls show Ron DeSantis with a seven-point lead over challenger Charlie Crist in the Florida governor's race. And coming up, UK Prime Minister Liz Truss has come under scrutiny from fellow members of Parliament. The Prime Minister will face Parliament for question time later this week. 
And Chinese university personnel and students are now banned from self-printing and from using AirDrop. Find out why after the break. In every country, communism gains power. Authoritarianism and death followed in its wake. Communism promises a world without suffering, and yet does the exact opposite. The party dictates what is right and wrong. As an investigative journalist, I want to understand why. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. The UK is issuing a threat alert in response to Chinese recruitment of ex-Royal Air Force pilots. The Chinese military has recruited around 30 British jet pilots to train their Air Force. China is luring pilots with large payouts of over $250,000 per year. The UK government said there has been no evidence of a security breach, but officials say these schemes are a risk to the UK and Western countries. The BBC reports that the intelligence alert is designed to warn former military pilots from taking these positions, although it is not against current UK law. The Chinese military is using third-party companies to headhunt the pilots. Among the companies is the Test Flying Academy of South Africa, which has no ties to the South African government. And you may remember our reports about the protest banners above a busy overpass in Beijing. After that incident, mainlanders are now finding other ways to spread the message, including self-printing flyers and airdrop. At the same time, netizens have revealed that some Chinese universities have issued emergency notices to ban self-printing and even requiring students to turn off airdrop. A netizen shared a screenshot on October 17th of a notice posted at Beijing's Tsinghua University. It requires each print shop to strictly control students' self-printing. It reads, all kinds of personnel, such as students, faculty and staff, are prohibited from printing privately without registering and verifying the printed and copied content. It also requires every printed copy to be reviewed by in-store staff. The notice also threatened serious action for any violation. Students also shared screenshots of a security reminder. It says many universities in Shandong appeared to use airdrop to spread harmful information to students. It asks students with iPhones to take the initiative and turn off the airdrop function and to report to their counselors when they encounter so-called harmful information. Other universities have issued the same notice calling it protection of personal privacy. The Chinese regime is holding the most important meeting in its political calendar at the moment, the Communist Party Congress. And even though the regime tightly censors news, the video of the bridge protest has quickly spread across the Internet, inside and outside of China. Dozens of Chinese Canadians rallied in front of the Chinese consulate in Toronto last Sunday. The protest was in solidarity with, solidarity, I should say, with Peng Li Fa, who was arrested for hanging the banner at the bridge. The leadership of the UK's new Prime Minister Liz Truss is in question. That's after an unsuccessful and overly ambitious budget was overthrown by the new Treasury Chief, Jeremy Hunt. Here's NTD's Flinders Kingsley with the story. Following Boris Johnson's political scandal and Liz Truss's economic crisis, the Conservative Party is receiving harsh criticism from political analysts. Among them is Professor Tony Travers. There have been a number of sterling crises in Britain over the years, economic crises for sure, and sometimes political crises. But the two coming together, where a political crisis effectively causes an economic one, which then government has to try to bail itself out from, I think it's pretty well without parallel. Former Finance Minister Kwai Si Kuoteng was dismissed following a rushed financial budget. Jeremy Hunt brought some relief to the market, throwing out almost all of the tax cuts and the energy policy, released just weeks earlier. But the damage done to the Conservative Party, and particularly to Liz Truss, is profound. 
The Prime Minister will face Parliament for question time later this week. The Conservative Party has two years until the next election is to be held. Her MPs will have to absolute nerves of steel because they're facing electoral oblivion if they don't change her or something else turns up. William Hague, a former Conservative leader, describes Truss's position as hanging by a thread. Flinders Kingsley, NTD News. The Australian Labour government has reversed the decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. The move changes the designation made by the Liberal government in 2018. Uh, today, uh, the government has reaffirmed Australia's previous and long-standing position that Jerusalem is a final status issue. Uh, and a final status issue that should be resolved as part of any peace negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian peoples. Australia's embassy, of course, has always been and remains in Tel Aviv. We are committed to international efforts in the responsible progress, uh, responsible pursuit of pros progress towards a just and enduring two-state solution. Wong also assured the Australian public of the government's commitment to the Jewish community as well as a Palestinian community. The minister says, said the decision to recognize Jerusalem was out, out of step with most of the international community. She said various countries expressed their concerns, namely Indonesia, a predominantly Islamic country. A NATO military exercise is underway in the Mediterranean Sea. The exercise dubbed ne Neptune Strike is taking place from October 14th to the 19th and involves more than 10 NATO allied countries, including the U.S., Italy, Romania, Lithuania, Hungary, and Poland. The exercise is aimed at enhancing the operation and communication skills among allied commands for both sea and air forces. The USS Bush was sailing in the Adriatic Sea as it participated in the exercise. We'll be providing uh, opportunity for our crews, our sailors, to interact uh, with uh, multiple nations. Today we have missions that are scheduled uh, for over seven and a half hours, flying from the Adriatic up to uh, Lithuania, into Romania, into Hungary, while we're simultaneously supporting operations in the Tyranian Sea with Mero Perito and the Italian uh, forces. And coming up, a group of adults won't let life's challenges get in the way of their passion to play baseball. And flawless diamonds do not get bigger than this. Sotheby's in Dubai displays the golden cannery. That's when we come back. The glory of piano masterpieces from the Baroque, Classical and Romantic periods. New Tang Dynasty Television invites you to join the 2022 NTD International Piano Competition. Together we preserve and revitalize the art of authentic classical piano music. October 29th through November 2nd at the Merkin Concert Hall in New York City. Apply now at piano.ntdtv.com. Welcome back. With the Major League playoffs underway, baseball fever is ramping up. But for non-Major League teams, September meant the end of their season. For one special team on Long Island, New York, it's particularly hard to say goodbye to another year. From Little League all the way to the Major Leagues, baseball is a passion that's hooked fans for decades. On a sunny Saturday morning, the Long Island Bombers are gearing up for a competitive game of America's pastime. This is a special team of volunteers who range in age from their 20s all the way up to their 60s. It's, you know, beyond a team and friends, it's, it's a family. James Hughes has been on this team since the 90s. He says there's nothing like that moment when you get up to bat and you're waiting for the ball. He sets up on the plate and waits. But when the pitcher throws the ball, all he sees is this. Darkness. That's because James lost his sight when he was three years old. Besides the pitcher, all of the players on this team are legally blind. That's the beauty of a team such as this, to, to give those people, uh, a, you know, that, that hope and that, uh, that feeling of normalcy. It's called beep baseball. The ball and bases all beep, so the players rely on their sense of hearing to navigate the field. You hit the ball, you hear the buzzer, and you're not even thinking, you just go. Ted Fass is one of the co-founders. 
At 11 years old, he had a tumor growing in his nasal pharynx, which severed his optic nerve. He's been blind ever since. I never thought I'd play baseball again. And that was a big thing because my life was uh, sports. This team gives him and the other Bombers that hope. It is the most incredible thing that a baseball team can make uh, such a big difference in, 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 these pe in their life. There are some slight modifications to the game. There's only a first and third base. Each one has a different toned beep. The batter doesn't know which base to run to until after they hit and hear which base beeps. Then they run towards the sound. If they're safe before the other team gets the ball, that team scores a run. And the outfield doesn't have designated positions. Each outfielder is assigned a number. There's a sighted person who stands in the field and yells out the number based on where the ball is going. That way the players know if the ball is coming to their section. Get it! And the pitcher is sighted. For this team, that's high school senior Ethan Shulman. These players have really taught me that uh, while it's great to have a passion, it's more important to share it with people that you love. A few hours on a Saturday that leaves a lasting difference in all of their lives. Even a little sweeter when they win. Long Island Bombers! The Long Island Bombers are part of a national blind baseball league that competes with teams all over the country. They even have a World Series in Texas. Ah, the great American pastime. You know, that has to be tough to play a sport without being able to see. I got to hand it to them. Yeah, absolutely. It just shows you, you know, everything's possible if you just put your mind to it. Words of wisdom from Evelyn. A father and a son fishing off the coast of New Jersey got a big surprise this week. A hungry humpback whale. Let's take a look. Oh, oh, oh Zach Piller and his dad were fishing for bass and tuna when suddenly the massive whale breached the surface and crashed back into the water right next to them. The whale actually tipped their boat, causing it to rock back and forth, but thankfully nobody was hurt. Juvenile humpback whales have been spotted more frequently along the Jersey Shore in recent years. That's scary, but really majestic, those beings. Have oh, you ever seen one in real life? Oh, yeah, I have, actually, off the coast of Maine. Beautiful sight. Its tail just went right out of the water. Oh, wow. Yeah, I have never. I can only imagine. But you know what else is beautiful, is beautiful to look at? What? A $15 million diamond that is being displayed at Sotheby's in Dubai. The diamond has been named the Golden Cannery because of its rich golden color. The Golden Cannery is one of the biggest cut diamonds in the world and it's about to embark on a world tour. Starting in Dubai, the jewel will travel to Hong Kong, Taipei and Geneva before being auctioned in New York on December 7th. The stone was discovered in the 1980s. It weighed 890 carats in its rough state. The stone has been cut into a pear shape to show the depth and richness of its color. So today at Sotheby's Dubai, we are unveiling the Golden Canary, which is one of the world's largest cut diamonds, weighing a huge 303 carats. It is also the world's largest flawless diamond ever graded by the Gemological Institute of America. Earlier this year, we had a, the 111 carat Earth Star diamond, which is also a brownish color. And this actually sold to a private collector from the region. So Wow, I've never seen a stone like that. It's so shiny. Yeah, and you know what's interesting about this? The stone was actually found by a young girl in the Democratic Republic of Congo. While she was playing in the rubble, she picked up the strange-looking stone, and it was later sold to a local diamond dealer. Wow, thanks for giving us that tidbit. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. But on that note, we have to end the show today. This is it. We'd love to hear from you, though. Before you go, share your thoughts and your story at goodmorning at ntd.com. So shoot us an email if you'd like. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.